Welcome to Lake and Bethel. It's good to have our video audience along as well as the rest of you. It's good to see everyone. My name is Sherwin. I'm the pastor here. And uh, I invite you to join us some Sunday morning. Check us out a little more on our website, lakeandbethel.org. And I also, I encourage you to take notes. Today, especially if you're here in the audience, you have a place in your bulletins to take notes. I'm going to give you four ways to reduce worry, and if you want to remember those by the time you get to your car or by the time you shut your computer off, it would be a good thing to uh, write these down. So uh, they're coming up in about seven minutes if my tracking is, is right. So today we're going to talk about worry, and on this slide you see some little dolls that are called worry monsters. I found out that uh, some teachers, particularly in the Boston area, are using these for kids that come to school who are really stressed out. And what they do is they have these kids, these are elementary uh, kids, write down their worries on a piece of paper and then they stick it in the mouth of those worry monsters. So the worry monsters eat their worries and uh, supposedly that helps the kids calm down a little uh, during the school day. I think it's kind of a cool idea. Um, let's define what worry is. Now, I, you know, Wikipedia makes geniuses out of us all, but there's a psychological uh, group that defined worry that's quoted in the, on the Wikipedia page, and I had to put that up just for fun. It says, worry refers to the thoughts, images, emotions, and actions of a negative nature in a repetitive, uncontrollable manner that results from a proactive cognitive risk analysis made to avoid or solve anticipated potential threats and their potential consequences. <sighs> Made it. Now, I expect you all to have that memorized by the end of the day. That's what said worry is. My definition is a little different than that. My definition of worry is being anxious about something that doesn't usually happen. Or, if I want to get theological, it's like I'm saying to God, well, I really don't trust your providence. I don't really trust how you're taking care of me. So, I'm just going to worry about it. Get up tight. It's like kind of thumbing God off, you know, to say, no, nah, I don't trust you. Well, that's kind of how a lot of times we live. We don't think about how, you know, if Jesus is sitting right here and he thinks all the times that we don't trust him, it's got to be insulting. You know, the fact is that our hearts are beating because of him. And yet we don't trust him. Now, when my dad was in his last years, I asked him, you know, what his biggest regrets were. And I thought it would be, you know, that he didn't pay for my education or something like that. But he said, no, his biggest regrets were, in, in this life, was the time and energy he wasted worrying. And he did worry a lot. He was a nervous guy a lot of the time. But that's what he said his greatest regret was the waste of time and energy that he put into worry. And he worried about rain for his crops and the livestock markets and, of course, his kids. Well, I just thought it was really interesting that he'd look back on his life and see worry as a waste. But he did. So what do you guys worry about? You know, you got different things, I'm sure. Older folks worry about health a lot. Finance is a big deal for lots of folks. Uh, how am I going to pay my bills? If you have kids, you worry about them. I'm amazed. My kids are all adults now. And I thought, well, I don't have to worry about them anymore, but I still think about them all the time, every day. It doesn't get any less. And I still remember the first time my oldest one, the John, the one that's around here, I watched him drive away the first time by himself. And I thought I had a heart attack. Yeah, Gordy and Jill, you probably saw me standing at the end of my driveway crying. 
as he drove away in that beat up old Thunderbird and and uh, uh, man that was traumatic by the time you get to the fifth one here kid take the keys go you know but that first one was was really traumatic you worry about your kids and I don't think I'll ever be able to forget that you worry about your marriage keeping that together you worry about deadlines some folks worry about world events like what's going on in Ukraine or whatnot. You worry about inflation. Some folks are worried about climate change or any change, really. And uh, today we're going to see that Jesus actually confronts worry, confronts it head on. So we're going to look at this, continuing through the Sermon on the Mount from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, starting with verse 25. And I tell you not to worry about your life. Don't worry about having something to eat, drink, or wear. Isn't life more than food or clothing? Look at the birds in the sky. They don't plant or harvest. They don't even store grain in barns. Yet your Father in heaven takes care of them. Aren't you worth much more than birds? So here he just flat out says, don't worry, which means that we have a choice. We don't have to worry. Don't worry about what you eat or drink or wear. And theologians call this kind of teaching providence. This is God's providence. God will take care of you. It will be all right. Everything you have right now is a gift from him. And the fact that you are alive is proof of his providence. He doesn't owe any of us life, and it can end at any time. We're so fragile. Having this new little granddaughter has reminded me again of how fragile life is. This child has to be taken care of all the time. She could not survive on her own. And it's how God designs things. We are alive because of his providence. So Jesus goes on and he says this, Can worry make you live longer? Why worry about clothes? Look how the wild flowers grow. They don't work hard to make their clothes. But I tell you that Solomon with all his wealth wasn't as well clothed as one of them. God gives such beauty to everything that grows in the fields even though it is here today and thrown into a fire tomorrow, God will surely do even more for you. Why do you have such little faith? So Jesus says, do you think worry can make you live longer? And we have a considerable body of evidence, scientific evidence, that tells us that worry can shorten life. And Jesus refers to flowers here. Look at that, they're temporary. Yet... They're beautiful. And most of the flowers in this world are never seen. They're grown out, they grow naturally out wherever they grow. And God takes care of the flowers and gives them beauty, so quit worrying so much about your appearances. And those of you who know me know that I just spend hours and hours worried about my appearance. But that is a deal for a lot of folks. Okay, Jesus goes on with this. He says, don't worry and ask yourselves, will we have anything to eat? Or will we have anything to drink? Will we have any clothes to wear? Only people who don't know God are always worrying about such things. Your Father in heaven knows you need all of these. But more than anything else, put God's work first and do what he wants. Then the other things will be yours as well. So put God first. Then you don't have time to worry about these other things. And basically what Jesus is saying is the cure for worry here is to prioritize. To put his will first. Do God's things as your highest priority. Report for duty, sir, is what this is and then God will provide. 
Jesus goes on, he says this, don't worry about tomorrow, it will take care of itself. You have enough to worry about today. Now, I don't like that. This is the version that I'm using primarily today. It's the contemporary English version. But I don't like that translation of this verse 34 because the word worry is not in the original Greek text. It's, it's a different word. It could be translated different ways. So I thought I'd look at the old King James version of it. And it says this. It says, take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow will take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Well, that doesn't take you back a ways. But you know, my dad on particular bad days, he'd come into the house and, you know, farmers quite often would go outside after their supper, after their evening meal to check on livestock or whatever and have a cigarette and, you know, that sort of thing. And he'd go out there and he'd come back in. And if he was really tired, he'd, say, he'd plop into his chair and say, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So I didn't even know that was in the Bible until I went to seminary. But that's where he got it from. And then uh, the New Living Translation, I think, translates the verse the best. It says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. So what he's saying here is focus on what God has set before you right now. Deal with the task at hand because tomorrow he'll have another task for you. So from this teaching of Jesus now, from this, these few paragraphs of Matthew 6, we can take four principles, four ways to reduce worry. And a lot of these are simply cognitive. One is Understand that worry doesn't change anything. Okay? I have to understand that. Because it doesn't. This morning, you look outside the window and it looks like nasty weather. But you know, the, you can worry all you want about the weather and the weather don't care. It's going to be what it's going to be. The weather doesn't care and won't change if you worry about it. Worry won't do anything for you. It just makes the bad things worse, and it keeps you from enjoying the good things. So remember verse 27, where Jesus says, can worry make you live longer? Does worry have any effect except to make you miserable? No, worry can't make you live longer. Your worries can't change the future. So trust God's providence instead. Is your worries change nothing except you. And it, how it changes you is it makes you miserable. So don't do that. It's really simple. Uh, we all know that worry just makes us miserable. The second one. Learn to live one day at a time. Jesus tells us in this last verse... There's enough trouble for each day. You know, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow brings its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. That doesn't mean don't plan. That doesn't mean, you know, cash in your IRA and whatever. It doesn't mean that. You know, I always say planning for tomorrow is time well spent, but worrying about tomorrow is wasted time. See, when you give this, these things to God, when you are telling him that you want to live one day at a time, well, that makes all the difference in the world. But what Jesus is saying here is take care of what he's put in your hands right now. There's nothing you can do about what's going to happen tomorrow. So take care of what's right in front of you. And then take care of tomorrow's stuff tomorrow. My dad's quote makes more sense than it ever has to me now. Is that when he says, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Fix what's wrong today, and tomorrow you can work on tomorrow. All right, the third one is believe that God will take care of your needs. Jesus said this, you know, only people who don't know God are always worrying about such things. 
your Father in heaven knows that you need all of these. See, it comes down to faith. Do you believe that God will take care of you? Do you really believe that? Well, as you face surgery, do you trust him to take care of you? You're putting your life in the hands of other people completely. Do you trust God's going to take care of you through that surgery? Or as you face, as you face inflation and economic downturn, oh, all oh, my money's going away. Those of us who have been around a while, you know, seen that happen a few times before, usually comes back. But do you really trust God during those times that he's going to take care of your needs? Do you trust him as you face rejection from family or from friends? You really think he's going to take care of you? And Jesus reminds us that God cares about flowers and birds. I don't care about flowers and birds. I like to hunt pheasants. But God cares about flowers and birds, which means he's certainly going to take care of you. So believe that God will take care of your needs. The fourth one, put God's work first. Where he said, Jesus says, but more than anything else, put God's work first and do what he wants. Then the other things will be yours as well. The older translations say, put, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these other things will be added unto you. This is where this whole reporting for duty thing makes sense. You know, I've got a long list of things I could be worried about today, but if I put first what God wants me to do, it's going to be a good day. Now, I'm a little concerned about getting the tire on my daughter's car this afternoon. But, you know, I've got other things to take care of first. And so I do, you know, put God's work first with everything. And then he'll take care of the details. Do what he calls you to do. And ask, what is he calling you to do? What's he calling every one of us to do? What does he mean by God's work first? Well, Jesus explains that in the next chapter. It's the same sermon. It's the same speech where he tells us exactly what he wants us to do. It's Matthew 7, 12. Treat others the way you want them to treat you. It's simple stuff. If you were hungry and couldn't get to food, how would you want people to treat you? If you were rejected or marginalized by most of society, how would you want people to treat you? See, as followers of Jesus, we are called to be the shepherds of society. We're to take care of these folks. So do your best to take care of those God puts in your life. And then you won't have time to worry about anything. You'll be busy. But the funny thing is, happiness just kind of sneaks up on you when you're doing that. So it's a really good thing. Well, folks, there's no question about it. Worry is a pain in the neck. Worry is addictive. You get this adrenaline buzz from it. Some people feel like they have to worry to be normal. But you don't. Worry is a choice. And when God's work is a priority for you, worry evaporates. We uh, took a little trip to Gatlinburg. We stopped there on the way to see Bob uh, and Angelica this spring. and Stopped in Gatlinburg and saw this bridge. Costs over 20 bucks to walk on a stupid bridge. Can you believe that? But we did it. 
So they're probably not going to get there again. So we walked on that bridge. And, uh, you know, it's up a ways. And as you can see, there's, there's some glass panes in there. Now, lots of folks get to that glass and they stop. Don't want to go across that bridge. But you can do it. See, this is what it looks like when you're up there. And uh, it's a little scary. But if you know, if you keep your eyes on the goal, you can do it. Now, I don't like heights. You know, I just don't care for them. When I was a kid, they didn't bother me, but now they do. And I got to that glass and I, I stopped. And I thought, come on, what's wrong with you? Be a man. And then uh, I figured out, you know, there'd be an awful lot of lawsuits if this bridge didn't really hold people up. So I'm going to walk across it. And I did, and it was no big deal. But it was fun to watch other people because they'd stand there. And older people would be standing there hesitant to go over it, and little four- and five-year-olds would be going, come on, Grandma, let's go. You know, it was just kind of cool how that worked. But uh, it's a little scary. I had to realize that the bridge was certainly going to hold me up. Now, God says right here in this passage that he will hold you up. And you can't exhaust his love for you. So don't worry. God's got this. And the important thing that you need to always understand, that I need to always understand, is that he loves us more than what we are capable of understanding. And that's the good news. So to the video audience, as always, thanks for listening.